to this book launch organized by the Center of Law and Social Transformation. Uh, we have today Ruth Ruby Marin, who's edited a new book called Transforming Citizenship, The Irresistible Rise of Gender Quotas in Europe. Ruth is a professor of constitutional law at the University of Sevilla, and she's also a part-time professor at the, University Institu the European University Institute in Florence. She will talk a bit about her book and the rise of gender quotas in Europe, and she will have a particular focus on institutional challenges. Afterwards, we will introduce a panel consisting of Ragnar Murios and Pilar Domingo to get a more global perspective on gender quotas. So Ruth, the floor is yours. this can you hear me yeah all right so um, this is the creature um, and let me tell you a little bit about its um, coming about and uh, what it covers as uh, Marianne rightly said because I knew that the presentation was going to be inserted within a course of politics and constitutionalism and I couldn't cover everything. I've decided to focus my presentation on the struggles, the constitutional struggles stirred up by the adoption of quotas, mindful that my uh, co-participants in the panel will then broaden it up to other, to other angles. Um, it's also because I'm a constitutional scholar and that's where I feel more <laughs> comfortable. Most of the authors, by the way, weren't. They were political scientists, but I always pick and choose to work with political scientists because I think that intersection between constitutionalism and political science um, is actually necessary if one wants to really understand these processes. So the book uh, has this provocative title, The... Um, Transforming uh, Gender Citizenship, the Irresistible Rise of Gender Quotas in Europe. Uh, in this case, it was in Helen Irving. It was Eleonore Lepinard, who works as a professor at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, that we did the uh, joint work. And in a way, it follows um, my concern, which I also expressed in the class before this, uh, on women's enfranchisement and political citizenship, broadly speaking. And here you can find, and you'd be amazed to know this book came out four or five years ago, and it hadn't been done before. There wasn't an edited volume systematically looking and telling the story of how women in Europe gained suffrage. Um, you know, the UK and its very vibrant suffragist and suffragette movement had gotten lots of coverage, of course, the movement for suffragism in, in other parts of the world as well. But a close look at countries like Malta, but also Spain, but in comparing across the board, I think it's amazing that, you know, we've gotten this far without telling these stories. So that looks at voting to become citizens, suffrage, but then, as I was telling you before, you know now that it took... 60 years on average be between the gaining of suffrage and the reaching of 20% of representation, right? So gaining the first suffrage was the first step, but the adoption of gender quotas uh, we saw as um, a necessary step because if we were going to leave things in the natural evolution, it would have taken forever to achieve anything close to parity. These are the country chapters that are covered by the book, which is, I would say, a, a, a big selection from uh, countries that have adopted quotas, because what is unique about this book is that it looks, uh, uh, um, it looks to gender quotas across the board. So the one domain of gender quotas that usually gets most attention is either voluntary or legislated electoral quotas to ensure women's representation in parliament, but there are other forms of quotas, uh, in particularly um, what we call public 
bodies, public bodies, public institutions, so quotas that look more in the executive domain, have um, also taken place in many countries, in some of them actually preceding legislated electoral quotas. And then a newer phenomenon of... Um, a newer phenomenon, uh, uh, which is the corporate board quotas, you know, the, the adoption quotas, adoption of quotas to ensure that women have um, equal decision-making powers at corporate board level. No other work had done that prior, basically, to look at these three domains and try to look, identify patterns, um, identify obstacles, strategies, and... Um, only by doing that did we think we were able to have an overall assessment of this phenomenon of gender quotas. And it allowed us, in fact, to introduce some nuances to the work and a hypothesis that had been adva advanced on the work on legislated quotas and to, in fact, challenge some of the um, assumptions that had come from that um, literature. Now, the starting point... For you who are social scientists, it's always numbers. Why these quotas? Why are they necessary? These are data from Council of Europe um, reports. And here you have a summary of uh, women's presence uh, as to 2016 at the legislative um, level. And you can see that 40% um, has been... Um, the, the idea of uh, gender-balanced composition is, is one that has been uh, advanced by the uh, Council of Europe in soft law instruments, and it refers to there not being more than a 40-60 disparity in terms of sex representation applying to both. And you can see that um, you know, the 40% target uh, was really not achieved Anywhere, the closest we get to that is in appointed as opposed to elected, interesting, upper houses. But you look at lower or single houses, the percentage is still 25.6. I'm not sure that in the last two years, I, I don't expect this to have dramatically changed. So uh, you can see that in spite of all the endorsement of parity or gender balance composition, we were still quite off or we are still quite off the target. Here you have some numbers regarding the executive power. Um, again, uh, it, looks at, it looks at both uh, central and government, regional governments. Um, you know, some very striking numbers, average of mayors, 13.4% only, um, you know, heads of State appointed by parliament, 14%. Heads of state by citizens, 9.5%. The closest we get to the um, target of 40% is in regional governments, 31%. And yet they are still uh, way off the target. Okay, this is, this is the executive. And this is a chart that shows representation of women and men on the boards of large listed companies. This is, applies to the EU, so not to, the, uh, to all of the Council of Europe states, but to EU. But look at how few, how none, <laughs> get to the 40% target, right? With an average in 2016 of 23.3. So if this is the gender balance zone, no country in the EU inhabited that zone. So this, I think, is a very intuitive explanation as to why these quotas are felt to be needed. This is starting to do funny stuff. Uh, what should I do now? Because it becomes, I don't know, it's doing funny things on the back of my head. So. <laughs> Probably now. Yes. Thank this you. is because I moved my neck. See, I have to move <laughs> like this. So it's very difficult to do this. Okay, I'll practice. Okay, so um, you can see why, um, you know, many women and women's movements and women femocrats running institutions that are created and have been created to advance the cause of women's are getting 
tired with the idea that you'll get there, right? Eventually you'll get there. Now you have suffrage. Well, but 2016, and these are the numbers in terms of decision-making power. So this is a chart that shows, that it's, it's actually from the book, and it shows the complexity. Um, so VPQ is voluntary party quotas. So look at Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Belgium, and, and France being the leaders and voluntary party quotas. PBQ is public bodies quotas, so quotas in the executive in different forms. LEQ is legislative um, quotas, so the legislator making um, electoral, legislated electoral quotas, men making quotas for the elected bodies mandatory. And then you see CBQ, which is corporate board quotas, with very interesting variations. Countries that took voluntary party quotas, like the Nordic countries, but then um, did not, um, you know, with the exception of uh, Norway, did not go for the corporate bo board quotas trend or the legislative um, electoral quotas, right? Very interesting uh, variation here about some that take corporate board quotas like France and then the, pub the uh, public bodies quotas. So a very complex um, scenario of sequencing in terms of adoption of gender quotas, sequencing and domain spread, all right? Now, the, um, as I said, the, the book looks at different questions it tries to identify what some of the factors uh, in timing of quota adoptions are, what explains what kind of quotas and the timing. Um, it uh, challenges some of the understandings about the connection between citizenship regimes and quotas, gender quotas in different countries. It uh, revisits the relevance of women's mobilization for some of these quotas. For instance, women's mobilizations have not been key in the adoption of corporate board quotas, uh, but they have been much more important for the adoption of le uh, legislative electoral quotas. It looks across the board and tries to understand processes of contagion. So when Norway passes its, in its pioneer and its corporate board quotas, how it affects then other countries, the impact of um, you know, some countries in, in their constitutional amendments to make quotas a, a possibility then on other countries adopting similar constitutional amendments, but also the impact of European institutions and European institutions, mostly soft law instruments. They don't have hardcore powers on this domain, but there's quite a few recommendations endorsing party democracy or gender balance composition. So uh, we try to track the importance that Europe and the European narrative has had in some of these processes, because whether they're hard uh, binding or not, they prove sometimes to be critical documents for women's movements or for um, um, women's machineries, state, you know, feminism to say, hey, these are commitments that we have to live up to and then, you know, demand action um, to be taken. All of that is uh, covered. The book has an introduction and a conclusion chapter that explains that. But what I wanted to do in the few minutes that I wanted to um, allocate uh, to, the, to the book is to explain um, some of the struggles um, that uh, the debate has created at constitutional level. Now, interesting... Um, if we pick up from where we left it, and we were discussing in, in, in class women's engagement in constitution making or lack thereof, and the fact that the constitutional project had started really, you know, leaving women outside of the equation, uh, um, what you find is that, yes, as we said, in post World War II constitutionalism, you have a democratic constitutionalism requiring as an essential component in its DNA women's equality, women's equality of rights, uh, 
uh, women's political rights, of course, but women's rights you know, in equal terms, more broadly speaking. This takes forms differently in different constitutions that have been drafted or amended after the um, 50s, but you know, I would say that the most common form that this takes is well, the recognition of women as equal rights holders and some equality provision that will often have a list of prohibited grounds of discrimination that includes sex, okay? Now, for the most part, the constitutionalism that was born in that era, in the post-World War II human rights revolution era, stops there. You don't find typically more provisions that deal specifically with women's political representation or, so to say, with you know, women's specific rights in any other, um, in any other uh, sense. Sometimes, like in the Spanish constitution, but in many other constitutions, you do find a reminder. So, you know, women's equality in the family or women's equality in employment of equality of women. And technically speaking, those provisions wouldn't be necessary because you already have general equality provisions, but these are reminders of equality in domains where there has been um, a lot of historical discrimination and marginalization and oppression of women. But typically, what one could say is that the, dom the dominant model in terms of constitutionalism in Europe has been one that we could call of you know, gender neutrality. Gender neutral, no discrimination on the grounds of sex, which one could think of one lives up to as long as one doesn't uh, draw distinctions on the grounds of sex when passing legislation or state action, right? So it's a notion of uh, gender neutrality. Now, that is not to say that some provisions, and I'm thinking of Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, contain clauses of what we call substantive equality. They do, you know. Post-World War II European constitutionalism is a reflection of that a melting of the liberal and the socialist tradition. It embodies the social welfare state European tradition. So some of these constitutions do include provisions like, I'm thinking of my own country, Spain, 9.2, that says it falls on the state to take measures to make sure that the rights that are formally recognized are meaningfully enjoyed by all citizens and groups. But these are generic mandates, right? They, they apply to a vision of equality of opportunities, yes, but they don't target any group in particular. They don't mention women in particular. Now, because that is the case, interestingly, although in theory, you know, one would think of constitutionalism, constitutional in post-World post War II, as an engine of transformation and equality for women, but because the dominant model was one of formal equality when it comes to rights. Formal equality, you know, there's that other generic mandate, but it's not a right, it's not an enforceable right, and it doesn't mention women specifically. What happens is that in many European countries, constitutional law has actually been an obstacle to the adoption of quotas. It has not been an, an engine that triggers, but actually an engine that holds back on this emancipatory agenda. Now, that is so, and the, paradigmatic, the most paradigmatic case of that is France, and I will say a couple of words specifically about France because it's such a fascinating example, but it's in general the case because, you know, quotas do differentiate, they do draw distinctions on the grounds of sex. So prima facie, you know, they, they, they draw distinctions on the turnaround, a factor that should be, irrelevant to the law. Um, so this notion of formal equality. Now, to be honest with you, the more the form of the quota is not that of a minimum representation, but of an equal representation, or a gender balanced representation that applies both to men and women, the less strength this formal equality argument has. If I say no less than 30% women, then I am drawing a distinction on the grounds of sex. If I say 
it doesn't matter, men or women, 50-50, or no one of the sexes can have more than 60-40, then I'm actually, it's, you know, you can defend that on the basis of formal equality. And in fact, it's an argument that the European Court of Human Rights uh, has relied on to, to say that there's no contradiction between that form of formulation of gender quotas and formal equality. But more importantly, some of the constitutional courts that stepped in to say, hey, 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 you can't do this, um, said so, be not just relying on formal equality and the gender non-discriminatory provision, but saying what is at stake here is not just the right to equality, it's the general representation system. You know, these are mostly um, elected quotas that provoke these constitutional struggles, and they say, well, you know, we have a system of general representation, unitary general representation, one person, one vote, no further distinction, right? And these quotas, you know, um, represent a deviation from that general system of democratic representation. So it's the combination of a formal equality which is in itself linked to a construction of a model of representation, general, unitary, gender blind, group blind, that is seen to be contradicting you know, constitutional standards. And finally, there's been also the idea that gender quotas interfere into political party autonomy. And that political party autonomy is often explicitly constitutionally enshrined. And there is often in the constitution uh, a provision that will uh, protect the autonomy of um, political parties. Now, interestingly, this is just a footnote. It's an argument that I and others have uh, developed in, in scholarly terms. Often, this party autonomy that is recognized in the Constitution comes with uh, an addition that says that the dynamics and the functioning of political parties has to be democratic. So it ends up linking to the other argument, what does democracy require? What model of representation lives up to democratic standards? With some saying, general democratic representation, party members vote freely and parties, uh, elites decide freely on where to, how to draw their lists. With other critical voices saying, no, nowadays democracy has to be parody democracy and therefore, in fact, political party autonomy is circumscribed by democratic constraints and nowadays those have to be interpreted differently. These are some of the arguments that have been um, used. I was mentioning to you the case of France because it's, it's such an amazing, amazing case. Because if you ask me, you know, what is the queen of quota adoption nowadays in Europe, it's France. But France has, had, has exemplified the most vivid struggles of both the Conseil d'État and the Conseil constitutionnel against the adoption of gender quotas. France does not just have you know, a, a general formal equality understanding, it also has, as many of you know, a tradition of um, universalist, republican, uh, group-blind, unitary um, citizenship. And the idea that you would have quotas you know, was seen not only contrary to this formal equality, but to the very core conception of this universalist i.e. anti-group, anti-multicultural, anti-anything that's communitarian, right, understanding of citizenship. So sure enough, when France passed, tried to pass the legislator in the 80s, its first quota legislation, the Conseil Constitutionnel comes in and says, no, you can't do this. This goes against the Constitution. Interestingly enough, what it took in France to be able to overcome that constitutional hurdle, I have my technical advisor telling me, I have two small ears, I think that's my problem. Can't fix that right away. So, um, so what it took is a reformulation. So very interestingly, a, co a close collaboration of activists and academics decided, okay, you don't want quotas because quotas, you know, threshold quotas, 20%, 30% seem to convey the message that that 20% of elected women are there to represent women's interests. And that goes against the core of the idea of, you know, everyone once elected has to represent everyone's interests. We are disembodied citizens, right? Just minding the general interest, Rousseau again. So what, what they did was a reformulation. They said, okay, you don't want 
threshold code is we'll go for full parity. And the new argument then became humanity is divided in two and general representation has to ha take those, that, that parity on board. So you can't have minimum threshold quotas, but parity um, you can. So that was, then, uh, that was then passed, but not before a constitutional amendment. Constitutional was, amendment, was amended, but what was interesting is that after they legislated the electoral, elect, the le electoral quotas, there was legislation on the corporate board front, and on the Conseil de la Magistrature, so the body, the executive body of the judiciary. And both, again, were turned down on the basis that the reformed constitution was only valid to cover the legitimacy of electoral quotas. So twice again was the French constitution amendment amended. You can beautifully see that struggle between the Conseil Constitutionnel, Conseil d'État, and the political forces. Twice a, a, again did the constitution have to be amended. Now, if you now go to the French constitution, you will see then nothing less that I think it's article, it's one or two or one, two, that recognize that, that it falls on the authorities, on the French authorities to take proactive measures to ensure women's full access to positions of political representation and social power. So it's a clause that also refers to the social powers because otherwise that was needed for the corporate board quotas not to remain you know, constrained to the, uh, to the political domain. So ultimately, you see that the French constitution had to be amended. Now the question is, is this just France or is, was this a broader phenomenon in Europe? And what we show in the book is that, in fact, it is a broader phenomenon in Europe. I mean, French is the utmost paradigmatic case. Um, and, and you do have some countries like Spain, where, quote, a legislation was passed, and the constitutional court went along and said, mm, the generic substantive equality provision I interpreted is sufficient to give coverage to, gen to this kind of legislation. For the most part, it was felt that adopting this kind of measures entailed a constitutional rupture. And what you have is, you know, so constitution, so Spain would be a case of accommodation through constitutional interpretation, but most other countries went through constitutional amendments. I divide them as preemptive enabling or reinforcing just because it's so fancy to come with, with taxonomies. But what it really means is that in some of the countries, it was felt that only if you had passed constitutional amendment could quotas be passed. Um, in other countries, so these are the enablings, in other countries, they were looking at what had happened in other countries and said, we better reform the constitution before passing the legislation for instance, Portugal, and in other countries like Belgium um, or Greece, what had happened is that already the courts had interpreted quotas to be valid, but uh, it was felt that if it came to be in the constitution, then you know the, the backbone and, and the strength of those measures would be uh, reinforced. Very interesting processes um, describing countries in which this is a bottom-up agenda with whether there's social mobilization behind these transformations. Uh, the, con the book uh, describes in particular Austria, Germany, and Greece where the clause that was passed was a broader clause uh, to ensure substantive equality, so recognition of equal rights between men and women, and the state being allowed to take measures to make sure women's equal opportunity, so substantive equality, nothing specifically mentioning the political domain, but very much as a result of a bottom-up and a cross-party cross coalition platform. In other countries, it was very much top-down with political parties and some individuals within political parties in contact with European agencies, uh, you know, pushing the agenda often, you know, more pro forma than, than, you know, really ambitious agenda by way of saying we are modern, we're living up to current standards, but then really looking at thresholds like 30% and not 40 or 50%. So we have those type of uh, processes and then very interesting, very interesting types of regional contagion effect 
where you know some countries like Greece, when passing constitutional amendments, say, "Well, but you can't you can't see that this is a that, that this is a European convention or a tradition in the making." You know, the shift towards uh, substantive equality. So the, the book then concludes, I think, that um, if post-World War II cons European constitutionalism was um, generally committed to the idea of social justice, but had nothing in it specifically enabling uh, uh, the transformation of the sexual contract that we were discussing, other than just formal equality, which, mind you, was big enough because many of the equalities in the family domain, for instance, you know, only happened in the 70s and 80s and even 90s in some of the European countries. Think of family names and male prerogative to have their names be the family name that is carried on to the children. So, mind you, you know, formal equality was a big, 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 big a victory, but there was nothing in that constitutional that, that would move beyond that. If you now look across the board, I think that uh, most European constitutions reflect um, one, a substantive equality model that focuses more explicitly uh, at women and or some provisions that I would say um, allow us to interpret that there, you know, there's no, we're not there yet, but that the, uh, the tendency is towards not just substantive equality, but equality in participation, which as you know, I was trying to explain is slightly, you know, it's slightly different because it doesn't look just at rights, it looks at you know, institutions and decision-making power with provisions that will, these are not yet rights, okay? Neither the substantive equality provisions nor the provisions that target women's political or um, empowerment are crafted as fundamental rights that one can go to courts and enforce. From that perspective, it's still formal equality that is a fundamental right, but they are provisions that enable and legitimate, you know, the transformative agenda towards more aggressive actions towards, you know, de facto or substantive equality. So anyway, I leave it here because I don't want to overstep my my allocated time. But this is just by way of showing you something that I think prima facie is a bit counterintuitive. You would have expected post-World War II constitutionalism to being, you know, to favor and push and facilitate this women's political empowerment. Well, quite honestly, on this front, constitutionalism has been more like, you know, a stone in the, on the foot um, that, you know, you need to free yourself from. Now, again, this then rings... Um, brings to the four other questions that we are deeply concerned with, like who sits on the bench? Who are these justices and constitutional courts? Our, our Women on the Courts project, and you will not be surprised to know that most of these interpreters of the Constitution are men. Maybe there is some connection between these two facts. Anyway, I leave it to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ruth, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we'll now have a two minutes break so that you can refill on coffee and snacks, and we will bring the panel up in the meantime. So I think we'll wait until the end for questions altogether. Yeah, thank you. Their panel, and also I forgot to say earlier that this event is streamed, so just to let you know. <laughs> so all your questions will be preserved for eternity. For eternity.
Hello, is that a test? Hello, hello? So now I'm going to mute it. Okay, I think it's time to start again. Uh, we have now assembled a panel of quota experts uh, who have written <laughs> <laughs> extensively on quotas uh, and women's representation more generally. Uh, welcome Ragnhild Murios, Professor in Comparative Politics at, that's her, at the University of Bergen, and Pilar Domingo, Senior Researcher on Politics and Governance at the Overseas Development Institute in London. So Ruth gave an excellent, pre excellent presentation uh, on gender quotas uh, in Europe and the struggles around it. So what we would like to do now is to broaden our focus a bit because gender quotas seems to be on the rise almost everywhere in the world. And today more than 130 countries have adopted one, uh, gender quotas in one form or another. Um, so the expertise found here in the panel covers a large part of the world. That's why I invited them. Um, so Ragnil, mm. you have written a lot about gender quotas in Africa. Uh, do we see any similar patterns to what Ruth have described for Europe? There might be some similar patterns, but I, I, when I was listening to Ruth, I was thinking that th there is one thing that is very different from the, the tradition in, in Africa, especially when it comes to constitutionalism and gender quotas. And that is that even though the, you do have uh, constitutions in some countries that have the same features of being gender blind uh, and also having uh, the general type of representation, we can see that some constitutions uh, are not actually gender blind or group blind. They are actually based on groups. Um, and that has had quite significant... So they have actually been engines of uh, increasing women's uh, participation in, in politics and in elected office. So there has been... So we, when we think of Africa and you think of gender quotas, uh, one of the... What people might... Uh, most people know is that Rwanda uh, is a country that has over 60% uh, uh, women in the parliament. And they... They don't have a group. They don't have a gender-blind constitution. They have like a, a, a constitution uh, where you have open for group representation. So actually, you have special seats reserved for certain groups like women. So there will actually be certain seats in the parliament that will only be filled by women. Uh, and that is also the case in countries like. Uh, um, Uganda, for instance, where you have special seats reserved for women. So the constitution is not blind. It is actually saying that there are groups that are marginalized and those groups, they need to be represented. And we have actually set off special seats for them. And it's not necessarily just gender, it's also in, uh, the, in Uganda, it's youth and it's for workers. And even at the local level, there's for the elderly people so, and uh, people with disabilities. So there are groups that deserve some kind of representation, which I think is quite interesting that at least some of the most, those countries that we think of as those that, that have re done really uh, great when it comes to uh, women's representation in Africa and uh, have uh, not just gender parity, but beyond, uh, uh, they do have that kind of representation. So maybe they have had this, uh, that the constitution have been an engine. Um, but then again, uh, these countries might not be considered as democratic. Uh, not because of this, but because of other things, but, but still. So that's another thing that is, of course, special with Africa, mm -hmm. that you see uh, gender quotas in countries that are authoritarian or, uh, yeah. So that's also different from, from Europe, or depending on how you see Europe, of course. And Pilar, your field of expertise is Latin America, but you've also written about Africa. Have you any thoughts on the on what's been said here? 
So I think I might pick up on some of the last points that were being made that I think are very interesting about some of the paradoxes in in sub Saharan in African countries, but also in Latin America, where there is seems there's is seemingly more not seemingly there is more progress in terms of constitutional text and legislative text on quotas. Um, both as a result of post-transition to democracy experiences in Latin America and more recently, and in in the same in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and more recently also in the context of post-conflict settings, mm -hmm. which are embedded in a wider international narrative where gender equality is much louder than it was, I think, in the post-Second World War constitutions that Ruth was talking about. But paradoxically, while these there are more women both formally on text and possibly in practice. It would be interesting to see how some of these countries look like in contrast to those graphs that you put up. I, th I think one of the interesting questions is, there are two questions. First of all, some of the risks, which I say not by way of trying to say, therefore, let's not have quotas, but some of the risks that sometimes this leads to resistance to women in politics being expressed as though they're only here because of the quota, they're not here on merit. Um, and so there needs to be a lot of work done to counter that. But secondly, if, if for the reasons that um, uh, Ranghil was just mentioning, in contexts where constitutional politics is not really what's shaping decision-making processes, then the additional questions that need to be asked in addition to whether women are present in formal political and public life is, are they present in those less visible decision-making spaces that are deciding politics? And that's where this paradox is um, is important to bear in mind. Mm. In Despite the resistance in some of the countries that Ruth was talking about, um, it we might think that women have acquired more substantive access to decision-making roles than in countries um, where in, they have more presence in legislators, but they may not be um, as influential in the real bargaining that's happening behind doors in more clientelist or patronage-based systems. And I think that's a question for empirical inquiry that has been undertaken, I think, in, in some of the research on quotas and... Mm representation. Yeah, we can maybe talk a bit about that because one thing is that quotas, depending on what type of quota, uh, uh, that depends on how effective they are, they, uh, they are in terms of getting women into decision-making power. But what what then? What happens when they're there? Uh, have any of you dug into that kind of uh, knowledge? What does it matter? Difference does it matter? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I only have a normative answer, so that's probably... I think that that is a question for social scientists, really, to, to answer. Um, I guess my, my only... My only... You know, there's, there is research mm -hmm. about, um, you know, what difference does it make when you have women in the legislature, when you have women on courts... Uh, is it that much of a difference? Is it not? Um, in what domains or in what questions? After what threshold? So is the dynamic when you have 20 or 30 percent of women uh, really different from when you have 40 or 50 percent women? So you know, so you know, the threshold um, used to be the threshold idea w was defended on the basis that unless you have a minimum threshold, then there's certain questions would not be put on the table. So having below 30% um, is, is really giving very little power. So if you have 20%, it's going to do very little difference. Uh, but then again, I think there's a question as to is uh, you know what happens when you go from 30 to 50 or to 60. And I think that makes a big difference as well because you know, the more women are in the room, the more authority they feel they have, uh, the mo less on a defensive position they are. So it's not a, a, an all or nothing. Um, I would say it, it, it really probably depends on what the numbers. It also depends on what women. We were talking about this in the other class. It doesn't, you know, it makes a big difference whether the women you have on board are very conservative women, um, often pushed by, you know, um, family members, 
and I'm thinking of some of the phenomena that I think you were referring to, um, as a way of showcasing, but really with very little agency and definitely very little credentials in terms of commitment in women's um, struggles, so the kind of women you have. Um, but So I will leave to the social scientists more of the evidence, but I would say that... Um, that in as far as the normative construction of that of of the question is um, is it is it that relevance the difference that it makes I mean I'm not saying the question is not relevant I'm saying even if we couldn't show empirically that it makes all that much difference you could still have I think um, several rationales on which you could defend uh, quotas one would be simply a fairness and equality argument. It's like, you know, women want to be part of the show as well, even if they are not different. They want to be part of these prestigious, powerful, they want to create the world. You know, God is a woman. They want to be gods for a little while and see how it feels. Um, and the other thing is, I think, because we come from a tradition that has defined authority, decision-making, and political power as quintessentially male, Having women, even if they're the wrong women, so to speak, even if they're not advancing women's causes, even if they get it all wrong, which I don't believe for a minute, it still is a cultural um, um, transformation to see the public space redefined in ways that challenge that separation of spheres and, and the gender role. So I'm just saying that, you know, I take your question, I think probably there's a nuanced answer, but I'm... I think there are arguments to defend even regardless of that. But having said that, you may know more about the empirical evidence. Yeah, at the one side, it's, it's, it's about what kind of changes we would think would happen if we include more women. And then it's also the different schemes or the different quotas or what is actually it that has happened. And sometimes it's, it's more to include, um, to under underrepresented sex into institutions where they've previously been excluded. Uh, so it's not really... So then you are included uh, and you can, can be there and you can work, but the, everything around you, as, as she said, the structures are there. So you have to work in the structures that's been there before. So the question is how much can you actually change? But of course there are also gender quotas that, uh, that are adopted in a more transformative way and that you want to change the whole structure or the gendered institutions that are there that are actually challenging these institutions. Um, for instance, if you have, like in the United States, where you have a, a candidate selection system that is very difficult for women to actually uh, get elected. Uh, there are ways of getting around that, but you know you would have to uh, introduce quite large institutional changes for those barriers to 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 go away. Um, so I'm thinking that the changes. You, sometimes it's more, as you also said about this. Symbolic, and as you know, uh, you studied a, you written a really nice dissertation about this topic, uh, the symbolic representation of women, that the idea that uh, women, um, that the idea of what a woman can do and a woman as a role model uh, is important, uh, and that's a change. So that's like an outcome, and then it's also not necessary. And but what we think about most of the time is substantive representation of women that the policies are supposed to change. So there are supposed to be an effect on which kind of policies that are adopted and that these are supposed to be more women-friendly uh, or women issues, although those two words uh, have been heavily criticized because mm -hmm. what is actually a women's issue. Uh, but there's also another thing that we can especially see in 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 the UK now uh, where you, they are also challenging at, um, and political institutions as a workplace. So you will see that women are coming in and then they're starting to ask, you know, for us to actually participate here, for us to be representatives and doing our job, we need to do some changes about the work situation that we have because we have a family. We cannot uh, be present uh, Every evening, we can't do this, we can't do that, we need to change, we have to bring our kids, so we need a nursery place, uh, and things like that. Mm. So that's also changes. So I think that when you bring women in, there are changes. The question is, and especially if it's up to 40, 50%, there will be some changes. But it might not be that you get different policies, and that all women always 
uh, work for certain kinds of, of, of uh, changes. Do you have anything to add, Pilar? I mean, I suppose maybe just to, re to reaffirm that I agree with everything that um, my co-panelists have said, and I think that it's important to give normative value to the intrinsic merits of achieving gender equality in decision in political, public, economic, and private life for all the social justice and equality principles that that um, brings to social life. And then in that sense, the I suppose the transformative potential is about the socialization effects that this brings or the kind of changes that you were describing are being negotiated in, mm -hmm. for instance, in workplaces in Spain, in the UK. Um, and that's, um, and it is worth asking, so that's different to the instrumental question and what, what is the difference? What difference does this make to the quality of policies? Policy is going to be more socially progressive, more gender friendly. Mm, the, that instrumental question is worth asking and is worth judging on empirical, on the base of empirical evidence. But it worries me when the World Bank says the reason we should support gender equality is because it's going to advance development. Mm. Regardless of whether it's going to do that, we should be supporting gender equality. Mm. Mm. Then we can ask the empirical question, and what difference does it make? But always mindful of the fact that we shouldn't be holding women in public space to a different standard and a higher bar than we are holding men mm -hmm. to. And I think that's something also to take into account. And maybe I just want to mention an article I read recently in The Guardian. Mm, it was an opinion article. And I, and I well, yes, she's absolutely right. She, um, the woman was saying, enough of celebrating when extremely effective and successful women reach decision-making roles. I will celebrate the day that a mediocre woman reaches those roles because there are enough mediocre men in those roles. Is that what it's going to take to, yeah. to reach gender equality? No, that's just an anecdote. Can I just add a couple of um, things? I, I totally agree with you, Pilar. And this is also, when you see the corporate board quotas, it's, it's the business case for diversity. So basically, it's, it's a win-win. It's perfect, right? We, we have a diverse board, we have a diverse workforce, and we sell better to all the groups that are, you know, potential customers. So, you know, one big question when the corporate board uh, quotas, um, when the EU was threatening to pass le legislation, remember Vivian Redding trying to push for that and in different countries and so different studies were saying, you know, what actually happens when you have more women join corporate board quotas. Um, you know, there had been the idea of whether women are as risk um, prone or more risk averse than, than men are. Um, so had, had it been Lehman sisters, what we have seen the mess of Lehman brothers, um, uh, th that was one debate. Um, it seemed that women came more prepared to the boards which I am not surprised, just because of that need to re to assert your authority when you are a woman, which is a double burden. So they, they actually read the documents. Um, but ultimately, I, I agree with you, Pilar, it's a risky thing. And you know, you were, and you have not surprisingly found contradictory reports commissioned by the mm, you know financial sector on what kind of difference it made. Some were saying, well. It's true, but at the same time, there are transition costs, you know, on, on how institutions change and what it means in the beginning. So I think that the, the business case for diversity, which is, yes, it's great for the excluded groups, but it's also great for the general interest. Um, you know, it's great if that is the case, but I would be very worried of making it rest on the general interest, because if that is the case, if we can convince <laughs> the population that it is not good because it's not cost efficient or whatever, then and the, 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 um, the case falls. Um, the other thing is that I don't think it necessarily, you know, you're often criticized, and you were indirectly pointing to this, of being essentialist when you say, you know, just because you have women, you're going to have a certain agenda. I don't think it, you know, I don't think you need to believe that women have different natures, really. Um, although I, I'm fine with um, with some people believing that. 
um, I, I think women are socialized differently, regarding, regardless of whether they have different natures or not. Their experiences of life as women, just if we look at statistics, um, are different. And that is sufficient of a relevant difference for me. I don't need to get into the biologist argument, among other things, because quite frankly, I think that after so many years of patriarchy, culture and biology probably blend. You know, if you... Why do giraffes have a big neck? Well, because, <laughs> because they needed to adapt to change climate <laughs> conditions and they were stretching their necks to reach the leaves and eventually they had longer necks because those with longer necks survived. So, you know, so I think that culture, social socialization and biology blend over the years. So I don't, I'm just inviting you not to fall down the, the debate of is it women's intrinsic nature? It's just differently. If you are a woman, you're much more likely to have experience certain things such as sexual harassment, um, you know, salary discrimination, um, sexual abuse, um, you know, difficulties in accessing decision-making powers. You yourself or someone around you who is a woman will have experienced that. And so you just have an epistemic, an epistemic gain that, you know, you feel that makes it for you easier to empathize with certain, with certain issues and political agendas. I guess the last thing is that um, what I don't think we can expect is that just by having women, we're going to, um, you know, see huge transformations in the agendas for as long as some of the neoliberal tenets are there and unchanged. So my belief is that if we just have more women, but we keep on, um, you know, basically uh, doing lots of things, in that neoliberal agenda, including not taking on board the social responsibility for caretaking and social reproduction, then quite honestly, some of the s biggest um, issues for women will probably remain untouched. So I would, I would, I, I think that we need to overcome the recognition, redistribution, whatever access, and 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 to and to engage with social transformation more broadly speaking. And I think that's what's beautiful about what's happening with the feminist movement as we speak. It's becoming a popular movement, among other things, because it isn't just a women a movement about women's rights, agendas, or interests, but a reinventing of the world you know, which, which takes in many other issues. That's probably the only way. Otherwise, it will remain, probably in terms of substantive agenda, a cosmetic change, which is not unimportant. Yeah. But that will, I don't know whether you share mm. that. Thank you. So quotas are very popular, but also very controversial, as you touched upon in your presentation. So... Are there any reported backlashes against uh, introducing women quotas or even, even against women, so-called quota women that have uh, either gotten elected or gotten a position in a firm based on quotas that you can tell us about? Mm -hmm. You can start. Yeah, I, it is in a way, but I, I feel like, as speaking from the African um, yeah, perspective, it seems that there were a lot of discussions about that, about that but that somehow that's um, it's not so much anymore. That they because there's a lot of research showing that it's not that um, that women have the same you know skills and backgrounds and education as as others. So the concern has been that uh, that there is that if there is gender quotas uh, in a lot of countries that they. Uh, it's just a certain type of women that actually get elected through those quotas. And that has been kind of one of the key criticisms, mm -hmm. that it doesn't really open for a different social class and also, also, for instance, different ethnic groups, but it's kind of certain elite women that get mm -hmm. elected. And so that's... So that one needs to think about... And I think that is also a result of how uh, the electoral systems look like, because if it's favoring a certain type of persons, mm -hmm. uh, that's also favoring a certain type of woman, uh, mm -hmm. and that's natural as well. So, but I'm not sure if there's, it's, it's like a, I haven't seen, there's a backlash on different topics, I would say, but not necessarily of women being in politics. Mm -hmm. So you can see that women are not necessarily taking on 
liberal views necessarily in Africa. So it's not that when it comes to gay rights that women necessarily are more positive. They can be just as negative as men. It's not. So it's not. And also about abortion. It's not like you will get an uh, MP uh, in Malawi to start easily to talk about the right to abortion. Uh, so it's not. Um, but you do have backlash against different kinds of topics. And there's also, of course, backlash if you think about... It's not necessarily a backlash, but there is political violence against uh, uh, female candidates. Mm. Uh, so it's not... And that there are is a lot of sexual harassment or harassment going on both in the parliament and also, of course, in during electoral campaigns. Mm -hmm. And but I'm not sure if that it's a if it's a backlash or if it's just you know those things are there. So it's not that it come that it used to be fair and now it is uh, like that. I'm not sure about that. I haven't read anything saying that it's worse. But it's it's of course it's it's quite uh, one of those barriers that are very difficult for women uh, entering into politics. That uh, and also of course for some men that there is this uh, high degree of political violence in mm -hmm. quite a lot of countries. Yeah. No, I actually think I mean in Latin America is a very interesting region to look at this question because the shift has been so fast in some of these countries. So we were discussing the Bolivian constitution, constitution-making process, the fact that women's groups had, had a big input in it. And as a result, um, you know, it, it recognizes parity across the board. And, and I do think that in systems that are still overwhelmingly very patriarchal and where you have this, this, this jump towards the idea of equal empowerment. Um, so it's not necessarily against quotas, but I do think there's a backlash in terms of, oh my goodness, I mean, you know, uh, it was agreed that you'd be in the kitchen and suddenly you want to run the country. And I think there is a sense of emasculation mm -hmm. that is probably, um, you know, feeding into the sum of extraordinary high levels of violence against women uh, playing. I actually think that part of the... Um, xenophobic, conservative, nationalist uh, populism that we are ex experiencing across the world. If you think of Bolsonaro in Brazil, Orban in Hungary, I mean Le Pen, uh, Salvini, uh, Vox in my region. You know, interestingly enough, if you look at, the, at what, the, what they defend, I mean, they very clearly target gender equality. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's not a backlash against quotas specifically, but definitely against women's empowerment and the breaking apart from traditional gender roles. So in a world in which global capitalism is leaving the middle male class so disempowered, that resistance against um, you know, letting go of the last bastion of privilege, which is the male privilege. So now you can't even go home and assert your privilege. I think that part of the rise that we see across the board with that anti-gender equality component, which is almost copy-paste. I mean, you know, do mm. these guys get together somewhere and say this is going to be the agenda? Because you see abortion, you know, wasn't on the rise, wasn't a debate in Spain anymore. Ah, it haunts you back, here we are, back again. I mean, it's like ludicrous. Where is it coming from? And I think that part of this has to do with this, this, these big changes related to women's empowerment and the emasculation of men who are being threatened in their identity, Islam, immigration, and no salaries to you know get mm -hmm. to the end of the month. Plus, on top of it, the women running the show, I mean, they can't recognize themselves anymore. So I think there is that big backlash going on, mm -hmm. of which you know, mm. quotas and women's political empowerment is one part, I think. That's my interpretation. And I think that that's uh, also part of the the new uh, new research coming out now, uh, focusing on resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, that there has been a lot of focus on on um, on uh, empower mechanism and you know what has actually been moving forward. Uh, but that questions of resistance uh, against uh, gender equality uh, in political institutions and and elsewhere, that that is actually the 
that is kind of the cutting edge. And and Karen Salis and uh, Isabel Angeli, they have um, written a, a new interesting um, in, uh, interesting piece where you can actually see that they are discussing uh, resistance and and thinking of resistance. What is actually that cause resistance uh, with dif- different kinds of mechanisms? So different laws give kind of different kinds of power mm-hmm. uh, and what kind of if there is a certain kind of type of power, then they, that will actually mm-hmm. be likely to 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 get resisted. So then the question is, if it's a backlash or a resistance, and mm-hmm. or how we're we gonna uh, mm-hmm. frame actually that. Um, yeah. So, Pilar, uh, <laughs> maybe just to, yeah, I agree completely, and it, I think we are seeing these quite diffuse but very strong reactions in different ways. In the case of the Colombian peace agreement. Mm-hmm. The referendum against it was to say, if this peace agreement succeeds, amongst other terrible things, we will be run by feminists and Mm. and lesbians. And there was all kinds of very problematic narratives along the lines that you've both been saying. And so Mm. I think it's, it's right that now the research agenda is about moving into unpacking these process dynamics of how gendered power Mm -hmm. relations Mm -hmm feature both in these spaces where quotas and advances in gender equality have taken place and looking at the gendered experience of how women are occupying these spaces. And I think there's interesting research also on actually the physical space of these places. Mm -hmm. As I understand it, Sarah Charles has been looking at the physical space of parliament in Westminster Mm -hmm. to see how women and male and female MPs are interacting and what their spaces look like, how sometimes that physical intimidation Mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. And we need to continue, I think, that research Mm -hmm. agenda. So Mm -hmm. let's stay in Latin Latin America for a second, because there you have this, some would call it a backlash against women's rights with the religious forces trying to infiltrate politics and uh, going against the gendered ideology. But at the same time, you see a rise in the adoption of gender quotas on the continent. So this is a very difficult question, but uh, what can explain these two seemingly counterintuitive trends? I mean, I think... Um, change to the extent that it gender quotas is both a rep, uh, an expression of challenging patriarchy and gender norms and, and itself uh, a measure of success. Processes of political contestation such as this one are never linear. You never have a cumulative f- if process that's never going to be counted or resisted. And I think these contradictions and paradoxes are explained by this inevitable tension between advances Mm. and resistance and ongoing iterative negotiation and contestation. If I I can just add to that, I don't think it's just Latin America. I mean, it's also Europe, right? And and the way um, religious forces are also, you know, trying Mm. to resist these changes. Now, by these chains, we're talking about women's political empowerment, but add to that the, del- the dissolution of yeah. heterosexual marriage, and you have it. I mean, you know, it's the family, it's the division of gender roles, and the family that is being challenged. And the family used to be conceived as the foundational cell of society with religious... Um, customary, I mean, you know, you name it. Um, this was the bastion of, of, of where poli- uh, religious forces, um, including those that have a role in, in law creation, um, used to define their agendas. So the subversion of this by women's emancipation from their roles, by new masculinities, let me mention that, new masculinities that we see to the fore. We were in the general strike of March 8th in Spain. It was wonderful to see young men massively joining. So new masculinities. And of course, you know, same-sex marriage and, you know, adoption of same-sex parents. It's, you know, it's the crumbling of, uh, you know, gender roles and masculinity and femininity definitions. So there's no, no surprisingly, 
there is where you have that happening. You have the conservative political and religious forces, which speak to each other quite often, mm. um, trying to resist this, I think. Not just in, I think in Africa, it's probably the same, right? Also Protestant, uh, you know, I, I'm remember, I learned this here, you know, last summer about same-sex relations and, you know, mm. the church having a very active role in, in preventing those kinds of transformations. So... Mm. Can I just, uh, just uh, make uh, uh, just comment on this? Because uh, yesterday, uh, here, we were showing a documentary on the world of Europe, mm. having a discussion with Neil Dacher, who's for a decade or more researched something like that. And he does really, really interesting work on how, uh, on how um, so you have religious forces and you also have ethno-nationalist uh, populist forces and, and how they're joining together and how that is also shaping traditional conservative movements in, in Europe. Uh, but he also, and this, uh, this was the immediate reason, but so what he says is, okay, so it's not only about abortion, that is one. One aspect, and it's, one. and then of course we know that the same actors are also engaged in, in issues around the homosexuality and same-sex marriage Trans. and so on, which is the big issue in, in the African continent. And we see the same sort of mixture of deeply held religious views mixing with political opportunism, trying to sort of broaden the base that we see in the U.S. and so on. But what he was also saying is that the new frontier is gender-based violence. And, and there are, so it is, there are U.S. organization and U.S. finance organization establishing themselves in Europe, joining legal battles around this, working against really sort of also organizing protests against the Norwegian Child Protection Services, Bonavana, because that is also part of this threats against the family. And that it is actually somebody's not sitting behind and orchestrating. Of course, it's also local dynamics and, and, and country dynamics, but it is not. I mean, this, not the, the, the anti, the, the, the battle on gender ideology was developed by the Vatican. It's a very open Absolutely. thing. It was very central yeah. in, in, uh, in Colombia during the, the referendum. So it is also, mm -hmm. so it's not by accident that it happens at the same time. Absolutely. And not all the actors will be sort of aware of all the, mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of, sort of autonomous processes going on. But it is interesting that, that the issue of gender-based violence, and particularly seeing it as gender-based, rather than just domestic or something else, is a big battle. Absolutely. And Vox has that as, as yes. one of its uh, new items. So to change, you know, Can laws. Can you just explain what Vox is? Vox is, a, pff, what, Vox is the new WhatsApp uh, made, uh, you know, spontaneously expression of right-wing extremist, um, and it feeds party in, in Spain, which got from being something really tiny, minor, no one knew about, to being a political force that can actually shape the political landscape, and it is shaping the political landscape in the region I come from, southern Spain, Andalusia, because it allows for the other right, well, it pushes the other right-wing forces further to the right and allows right-wing coalitions. And it feeds itself basically on the secessionist and how we have been, you know, federalism was a poor uh, idea to start with in Spain. So challenging basically not just um, the weakness or softness with which the Catalan issue has been handled, but more broadly speaking, just the whole state of autonomy is the federalism structure. And the second biggest identity feature is the anti-gender equality. Um, so one of the things they, 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 they say they want to propose is, is to change legislation that has been passed to protect women against violence and turn it into a gender neutral domestic uh, violence that covers, so denying basically the gender specificity of uh, the phenomenon. But mind you, in the prior class, we mentioned Tunisia and women p taking the streets to fight against Nahda wanting to introduce complementarity as opposed to equality. Well, complementarity has always been the Vatican doctrine. Mm. 
it hasn't been equality. It has been complementarity. So it isn't an Islam feature. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's the traditional religious construction of a family where we have, you know, separate but equal. And we know that separate but equal never really is equal. So, you know, so it's not, it is really big and, and it's, they, they get together and they have mm -hmm. a common, Putin, Putin also with right, violence was, against women, that was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So before we open for questions from the audience, I have one last question for you. Uh, quotas are often presented as a temporary mean uh, mm -hmm. until that we use until we don't need it anymore. Do you see any signs that we can... Are, are we there yet? Or are there any signs that, uh, that this will happen anytime soon? Well, you saw the numbers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But of course, it, in some places where you have um, voluntary party quotas and you have parties that have... Oi, sorry. That's right, your voice is gone. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I think that in countries where you have voluntary party quotas, uh, you might see that maybe there is not such um, an importance that you have, that, that the, kind of the practice is so important that you, you might at least think that someone would uh, assume that taking the, the quota out of uh, party constitutions, that that would not matter so much because you have these processes mm. and, uh, and that you follow and you would do that no matter what. Mm. Um, but I, th I do think that we have not seen anywhere that... Um, I think it's going to the, the other way, that there are processes now of uh, enforcing rules, uh, making design, better designs of quotas that are already there. Legislated quota where you find out that, you know, mm -hmm. it was just this really unbinding uh, rule saying that kind of specifying just a target. Uh, and then you see that there are mechanisms connected to that with uh, either sanctions like pun fun uh, funding pun uh, punishment, for instance, and other things. So I, I don't think that it's going to, to, to go uh, to be kind of uh, in very few places that you can think that this is not actually needed anymore. Yeah. Um, and it gets, a, it's like all institutions, it gets a kind of dynamic of itself. Mm. So it's, it's also, it has its own dynamic. And if you have an institution, it's difficult to change it, mm. no matter what kind of institution that is. Someone likes the institution as it is and likes to have the status quo. Mm. Mm. I agree. I think empirically, it's it's exactly as you're saying. You know what we see is, <laughs> you have quota legislation, and then you have all the parties and the males in the parties thinking of a way of circumventing the quotas. So it's a fight about how can we really make sure that the system is applied through sanctions, through zipper list or whatever, horizontal and vertical. I mean, there's that kind of battle going under the scenes about male resistance. Some countries have said, well, let's just let's just add more seats so that we don't have to give up our seats. And they have found that that was the best strategic move to get quotas on board and not to have to give up their power. So you have that kind of resistance at that level. And But the, the fact is what we see is rather, uh, as you say, mechanisms, better better mechanisms, sanction, better sanctions, uh, sanctioning systems. Uh, you see the rise in the numbers so from threshold to parity or gender balance. Um, I think that that, and what I think, so CEDA, which has been the umbrella uh, for women's movements in many countries, does coined only the only provision in terms of substantive equality is this kind of temporary special measures. And the reason why that is so is because, as I told you, it was formal equality that was. So this is like an exception to formal equality, affirmative action type of exception, only for as long as it is needed. I think that what we see coming, and I don't know, you know, is, is, is the idea of it is not about just rights and temporary measures to fix a small problem. It's a, it's a new democratic understanding. It's a new understanding of democratic legitimacy where mm. just as if you go to a conference mm. and you see only men speaking, you start start having a reaction that maybe you wouldn't have had 15 years ago because that was just the way things were. Well, now, same thing. You open the newspaper, you see all these men making, you know, I think there's a more fundamental change going on that it's not temporary fixes for women's opportunities. It's more about 
what is perceived as legitimate or not when it comes to decision making sites. So, so I think it, it it is it is here to stay. We definitely, you know, you're talking Nordic countries that were pioneers and voluntary mm. orders and have that tr consensual tradition and don't like you know things being imposed because they you know rightly think that you know through negotiations and they can do that but on the other hand I don't know how you feel about this I'm, I'm scared about not letting go of protections because you see backlashes and you see backlashes I mean on other things less so but on the gender thing I mean abortion again I mean it's like really you do you can't take anything for granted mm -hmm. you see things coming back to the fore and being fundamentally questioned. I don't know about the Nordic countries because they've they've made it so much of their identity and mm. political identity to have a state feminism and, and these kinds of commitments. But mm. other than the Nordic countries, I would be very f afraid of letting go of any kind of guarantees because I see things can get to be challenged again. But what has been a, a challenge a woman in some people are fearing is that you have authoritarian regimes that are really yeah. good at uh, protecting women's rights and also women's inclusion in politics. And it's actually using uh, somehow uh, inclusion of women as a way to get increased, uh, increased legitimacy yeah. and also to increase support. You know, women are voters. Uh, and uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a nice system. So what is actually fair that if in some countries where you have these big parties uh, that where the political scene is dominated by big parties that has guarantee for women's inclusion in politics and actually guarantees the gender quota. What if those big parties fall? Because actually mm -hmm. yeah. gender uh, equality and uh, women's inclusion in politics is seen like something that this big party that might also be authoritarian is a part of their uh, agenda. So then the question is, of course, in, in places like Rwanda, in Uganda, if the dominant party fall, would actually those who come after and want something new, mm. uh, do they want to keep keep having uh, gender equality? And it's also in Ethiopia, for instance, they are taking on issues. Uh, the, the government is more and more focusing on gender equality being the best in the world. Uh, and the question is, if it's gender equality is tied to mm. uh, regimes uh, mm. that are authoritarian, uh, what is kind of the reaction to that if those regimes fail or uh, are weakened? That's, uh, yeah. Pilar. Mm. Mm. No, I think that, that point is an important one, but I suppose the counterpoint is that they are not authoritarian because they have gender equal presence mm -hmm. nominally. They are authoritarian for other reasons and have sought to legitimize their authoritarianism by saying, but we're gender equal and that buys yeah. them legitimacy internationally. But it, the cause of their authoritarianism isn't the gender equality component. So I think that's the thing that needs to be resisted rather than that we buy into that narrative. Yeah, but in the popular imaginary, yeah. absolutely, mm. it's, that's it's right. Risk. And I'm not that's thinking not just of Africa, I'm thinking of Romania with Elena Ceausescu having played such a role mm. in joining, you know, the International mm. Fora for Women and also Mubarak's wife. So both in, in Egypt and Romania, initially, you know, the feminist cause was very much resisted because it was linked to the wives of the dictators and their state form of feminism in authoritarian regimes. So I agree with you, but in terms of this, the popular imagination if the link is drawn it's it's very powerful it's very powerful to to resist it mm. Mm. so i think it's time to open up for questions we have this catch box thing which is very fancy so just Does it work the catch box you yeah. just throw it see, see. did you want to uh, so for the last... Oh, the last. <laughs> I thought it was to keep people <laughs> awake. <laughs> I thought it's, it's at some point Siri is <laughs> just going to start throwing this I know, and they will all be so... <laughs> we will have to catch it. <laughs> but I want to, I want to, go to start oh, from the last point. So, because, because in some ways, the, for instance, in Uganda, the way in which uh, gender quotas are, are implemented are that there are additional seats for women. There are, for every constituency, there is a woman's seat. Mm. seat. And in a way, uh, there is also this way of saying, okay, so it's so gender quotas can also be seen as a more corporatist mm. 
a way of thinking about democracy. So it's a more corporatist way mm -hmm. of, uh, of including groups in, which is, I mean, uh, in, in, in Norway, for instance, that's an important part in addition to electoral democracy. It's like, okay, so we talk to the labor unions, we talk to the different groups, and we make a lot of decisions in this way. And, 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 and that if you look at, at gender representation as a form of corporatism, it is sort of also, um, <clears throat> it's also about the way, so I'm not saying that these regimes are not repressive, because they are. Uh, but repressive and authoritarian are not necessarily uh, always the same. So maybe could, because in Rwanda, that is what the government claims that the participatory democracy in a way, that it's participatory and that gender representation makes it more, uh, not only sort of better, that it scores good in another dimension, but that that is actually a crucial democratic dimension that can be seen as a form of corporatist one. Hmm. I saw there was... Yeah, so I'm going... Oof. <laughs> nice. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. don't catch it, does that mean you don't get to ask? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, try again. <laughs> and if you take it, you have to ask You don't have to question. turn it on. Like if someone throws it at you, you but have I to ask the question. Not. Is it on? No. Yeah? It's it on? Is? Ah, okay. Um, I just That's wanted to know a little bit more about your thoughts on how quotas um, put women under a spot and how this can be actually disempowering for them. Because, for example, you were talking about how it would be interesting to see how women are taking position of power that are not seen in the public and that actually are decisive. And, for instance, when you have women in power, it can be easily taken as a progressist facade. So you would have, like, party leaders that would be with a woman, but just to say that they are actually progressist. For example, if we take Chile and uh, Bachelet as a president, she's always in a non-decision position because whatever she chooses, she's going to be seen as the mother of the nation or either a strong woman. So when she wanted to build up the budget for war or stuff like that, she was surrounded by tanks, but then she wanted to do some gender laws and she was the mother of the nation. So I'm kind of skeptical about this visibility of women and yeah, that. Okay, let's take a few more. In the back. Oh, that's a difficult catch. <laughs> yeah, that's a... uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation and panel discussion. Uh, I come from India, where in 1993 the Constitution of India was amended to um, enforce 33.3%. Uh, quotas for women in at the level of the villages, mm -hmm. so in rural rural areas where we are talking about uh, local government or uh, self governance uh, councils. Now this was so in 26 years it was we could have assumed that this would now percolate upwards because as you know India has a federal system mm -hmm. where we have a union government a, a central government and we have state governments. Unfortunately, uh, these this quota has not occurred at the state level or the union Federal. level. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a little bit of work 10 years back uh, on, on this issue, uh, but I'm very much a social scientist who comes uh, to at this, who looks at this issue from uh, the perspective of gender and development. So I was particularly interested in looking at you know, what kind of women are on these councils, on these village councils, and what kind of impact they are making. And something that I think, Ruth, you said in terms of, you know, whether these changes, these constitutional amendments have occurred uh, within the larger context of large-scale mobilization, a grassroots movement. So it's more bottom-up, or rather has it been top-down? Mm -hmm. And that, I found in my own research, played a very pivotal role in, in how the women came to actually own their positions. And if they could actually, you know, when we say make a difference, not just formal uh, representation, but more, more substantive, is when they had links with larger grassroots social movements or women's, women's movements. 
So I think that's an interesting question in terms of, I don't know what's happening right now in India because I haven't kept up much, much with mm. that. Mm. But I think this larger connection with women's uh, movements, with uh, grassroots uh, movements can make, I think, more of an enduring impact yeah. in how women come to also see themselves. Because one thing is, of course, giving them the rights, but are they prepared to take the rights? Are they prepared also to be able to enforce their roles and you know, their uh, mm -hmm. kind of commitments? So I think uh, women's groups who worked with training, training village women to give them legal literacy, gave them you know, political legal tools, told them, OK, this is your role. These are your rights. This is the kind of domains you know, under which you can take decisions. Uh, road construction, schools, health, public health centers. So that, I think, in those states, West Bengal and uh, Gujarat and other places, there the women have been able to make more of a transformative and not just be there formally, you know, on these bodies. So I think that's an interesting, I mean, this was just a comment. It wasn't mm -hmm. really a question. Yeah. So. So I don't think we have time for more questions because there's five minutes left. So you have five minutes to answer those three we questions have slash comments. Okay, so quickly on India, maybe. Um, so yes, I mean, if you look at, w at the history of women's suffrage, there again, you see the local being the first site that was conquered and the national later. There, there is a very interesting uh, question about gender and federalism. What are the domains of decision-making that are seen as more for women? And, you know, it has to do often with mobility. Women will get engaged in local because that's where they live and they don't, you know, that's where they are, that's where they raise the kids and they get engaged in local community. I believe that part of the problem in India, and I haven't been following, I know that there was the local success and then endless struggles about how to make that, but I believe that part of the problem in India, which links to the possibility of having a common social platform, as you were saying, was the caste system and the quotas for the caste system and the intersection between that. So what women are being privileged. And one, um, one um, new instrument that is being crafted that I think is interesting and promising is nested quotas. So um, that are being experimented, I think, Afghanistan and I don't know what other country. Melanie Hughes writes about this. And in the book on, on multiculturalism and parody, there's a chapter that looks at nested quotas. So the idea of having where, where you have gender quotas to make ethnic quotas within those quotas and vice versa. So there's still very little experimentation along those lines, but I think that could be maybe, maybe a promising venue because yes, the problem often is do women's quotas come at the expense of other you know, discriminated against groups so that if we enhance women's quotas, we will see less power to the more disadvantaged groups along other bases. And on quickly on the on the um, on the women and, and, and the resistance and the Bolivian, you know, you're coming but I think it's the answer is more women. I mean, I actually think parity is, is more the solution than minimum threshold quotas. I do think that minimum threshold quotas puts pressure on women you know, extra pressure and renders women more vulnerable. When you say it's parody, it's 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 parody. It's actually it's actually parody for both sexes. And that raises another interesting mm -hmm. question which we haven't discussed, but it's fascinating maybe for another conversation is what happens when you have women only in one list? And then it or on a panel <laughs> and it gets challenged because it goes against parody. But there you can very clearly see that the logics of parity and of temporary special measures to protect, you know, to include the undermined group are actually different logics. Mm. But, you know, I would say only more women. I mean, for as long as women in power remain a minority, they will always be tokenized. And it's going to be an impossible role to play. As we were saying, you're either seen as too authoritarian and too strong and not feminine enough and therefore an aberration in terms of women, or you're seen as too soft and therefore not a political, uh, politically abled, you know, uh, authority. So it's just more time and more women. That's the other thing. Yeah, people say, it's like, come on, you know, we've been disenfranchised forever. Now we've had like a few years of quota legislation and you want to judge, make a judgment about whether they work or not? Give us 200 years of this and let's then reassess, right? <laughs> it's an idea of, 
centuries mm. of disenfranchisement and you want to now test after five years mm. the difference that it has made that is so totally unfair and mm. unrealistic, don't you think? Mm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just uh, to your questions, I, I think that a lot of the focus now is uh, on, on uh, training of uh, of. Uh, for of women in particular and also others who want to run for candidates and also uh, in parliament. And then there are a lot of issues that are discussed uh, connected to political violence, for instance, how to raise funds and other things that is all across the world. We can see these uh, different initiatives popping up in the United States, in Malawi. So it's kind of, it's, it's almost everywhere. Um, and... Um, and so I think that there is a focus on that, that you d just don't have this quota and then you, you, you make sure that some women are getting elected into office, but you actually also accompany. start to accompany that and start to actually have training. Uh, and I, I think, uh, and also to kind of increase the knowledge, because I think, at least for having uh, interviewed quite a few uh, parliamentarians in, in Africa and also uh, candidates and politicians. Uh, it's kind of a very powerful uh, w women and also men who runs for office and, and they have like a charisma that is kind of beyond uh, what is I will say normal. It's kind of it's Average. quite impressive. It's yes. it's it's like they kind of they, but sometimes they don't necessarily have the knowledge in how to maneuver to have an uh, in effect. And also, of course, no matter who you are, uh, the pressure you are in when you put at the spot, it's, it's enormous. And, and having knowing how to handle that is, of course, uh, important. But there is an increased focus on both uh, alternatives to gender quotas because, you know, there is gender quotas in 130 countries, but in a quite a lot of countries there is not gender quotas. And as you explained in the beginning, there are these con constitutional re reasons why there might not ever been be any uh, gender quotas. But that doesn't say that they're not alternatives that they are working out. Like for instance, using funding and other things to 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 en enhance gender uh, um, balance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so unfortunately, our two hours are up. Uh, thank you. Didn't you. Really oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe just say uh, I fully agree, and that we uh, there's quotas are important for reasons of parity, for reasons of socialization, that women need to be there in those places. And I think my point about the invisible pow spaces of power is not that they are instead of, but rather that we need to know more about mm -hmm. how women navigate those. Mm -hmm. Because that's very often where the real decisions mm -hmm. have been made about political negotiation, mm -hmm. and especially so when the formal democratic institutions are, are more nominal than real in terms of that power play. And that's where I think um, Golf, an important... Clubs and pubs. Yes. Golf clubs and pubs. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. So sorry. <laughs> Thank you all for a for a very uh, interesting discussion. Um, please remember to follow the Center of Law and Social Transformation on Facebook and on check out their web page for upcoming events. And I hope to see you again soon. So thank you. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Mm. I, I I don't have a yellow. I want is that is the yellow okay? Oh, there we go. Are you stuck with the red? Did you want the yellow? Because I okay. I don't mind. I don't mind. I don't mind. Are you sure? No, you can have on each. On each. You can have a yellow one. Can I have a yellow one? She was. You, you love the blue one. I have the blue one. I don't have a yellow one. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, yes, of course, of course. <laughs> yes, me too, Miss. Me too. <laughs> yes, please. I, don't know, I, could, I think this library in the background yeah. sitting looks beautiful. Yes. Here, that's right. Maybe I should have your book in my hand. Oh my goodness. Maybe I should have yours. Well, I don't know. It was a book. Yeah, it's a book. Yeah. But I know it looks like I have written something. No, no, please do. Please do. Great. Thank you. Send it to Eleanor.
I was just wondering if I can ask you another question. Sure. Um, 